start the uh, presentation with our sponsorship today uh, is Hospice of the Bluegrass and Turner West is going to be presenting uh, basically understanding hospice care here in Jessamine County. We appreciate you coming out. Yeah, my thank you. Thank you. All right, so Dennis has worked so hard to get us a microphone. You'll see that I do have PowerPoint slides, and if anybody's interested in those, I'm happy to email you them. I have my card there in the back. Uh, first, I just want to thank you all for uh, allowing us to be here today. It's really nice to talk, uh, get an opportunity to talk about hospice care generally, but specifically to such a distinguished audience. So uh, thank you for having me here. I want to introduce Danelle and Coldiron, who is the clinical site director for Lexington and Jessamine counties. Uh, and so if you haven't met Danelle, and she's been here a year now, which is kind of hard to believe, uh, you know, make sure that you uh, say hello and um, presenting 101 silence your phone I failed that one um, so you know for the next 20 minutes or so I want you to to think about a very difficult topic and that is hospice care end-of-life care issues around death and dying I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about hospice programs and services but I hope when we're done today you have a sense for why hospice is designed the way that it is who we take care of when we take care of them uh, how we're paid for that sort of thing so I mean, maybe that's ambitious in 20 minutes but I think we can get it done um, so I just want to start off by asking a question for you to think about and that is what is a good death what does that mean to you what would it mean for you uh, for a member of your family what are some of the things that might be important to you and you peace comfort, comfort. anybody else want to throw out just a couple things compassion, compassion. Surrounded, by surrounded by your family and friends yeah natural death, natural death. Mm -hmm. as opposed to like Mm -hmm. Comfort, okay. Yeah, and you know, we've asked people, um, there have been surveys about this, what 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 does a good death look like? And it turns out when you ask people, there are really some recurring themes. Number one is people want their pain and other bothersome symptoms controlled, right? To have some control over that process and to be uh, comforted, as you all said. Number two, they want access to expertise. So when we talk about hospice care, hospice providers, hospice clinicians are really the experts on issues around death and dying, pain and symptom management, um, identifying goals of care at end of life, uh, so that access to expertise is very important to have compassionate providers uh, and I think if there's one thing that hospice providers are really known for it's for their compassion and ability to treat the patients and families that we take care of with respect and dignity um, an ability to have your affairs in order and that's you know our social workers are really uh, fantastic at this at helping our patients and fa families find that that closure that sense of peace if there are um, matters that need to be taken care of legal getting your affairs in order they, they can assist with that um, and do so on a daily basis and then uh, and this is this is pretty um, interesting the ability to express four thoughts at the end of life number one is to be able to say I love you to the people that you love an ability to say thank you for what you've done and being a part of my life. Um, I forgive you for anything that uh, you've done to hurt me, and please forgive me for anything I've done to hurt you. So those are really kind of what people want when it comes to their end of life care. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how hospice is designed to respond to that. Uh, I want to talk specifically for a minute about hospice of the bluegrass because we have been in central Kentucky for uh, well over 35 years now. We started in, well, over 30 years. We started in 1982 in, uh, oh, sorry, we started in 1978 and the Medicare benefits started in 82. Uh, but we've expanded into 32 counties across central, northern, and southeastern Kentucky. And we've been um, here in Justman County for quite some period of time. We actually have a team uh, that works um, specifically specifically with the patients and families here in Jessamine County. One of our nurses has been in this community for over 20 years. She's uh, one of the best nurses that we have. Um, and Hospice of the Bluegrass really is recognized as a national leader in end-of-life care. Uh, we take care of about 650 patients on any given day. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization certified by Medicare, Medicaid, and the Joint Commission. Um, we're governed by a board of directors. And our mission is to, I, I just want people to hear our mission, I think it's important to hear the mission sometimes of organization, is to provide patient-centered care to the seriously ill and their families with excellence and compassion, engaging in community partnerships, education and counseling, offering opportunities to staff, volunteers, and donors to enrich lives through their gifts. So we talked about, Russ talked about uh, the golf scramble coming up. One of the reasons that Hospice of the Bluegrass is a premier hospice in the country is because of our communities, the, the individuals, the organizations who share their time, talent, and treasure and enable us to do more than simply what's required to get reimbursed for our services. So um, I wanted to you know, thank Russ and, uh, and, and just all, if any of you all are out here, volunteers, donors, support Hospice of the Bluegrass in any way, I just want to say thank you very much because it does um, enable us to provide that high-touch special care that um, 
we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So you all probably all have an idea of what hospice is. We take care of seriously ill patients, typically patients who are in the last six months of life. The focus when uh, an individual enrolls in a hospice program is to enhance, to maximize an individual's quality of life as they define it. Oftentimes that means being free from pain and other, and, and other bothersome symptoms. Um, if there's psychosocial, spiritual distress that that's attended to, uh, but that we allow that particular person to tell us what quality of life means to me, what means to them, and then we provide them with a team of highly trained medical professionals that helps them um, reach a, a higher level of quality of life that's otherwise possible. Um, the care, hospice care is really about supporting that patient, but also supporting the, the caregiver. So if any of you all have had a hospice experience, I'm hoping that you can attest to, uh, we really do like, look after our caregivers as well. And we allow that patient and that family to tell us what's important to them. We establish, uh, help them through conversation, establish goals of care for whatever remaining time is possible, and then we develop a plan of care around those goals uh, with the aim of ultimately maximizing an individual's quality of life. So that's kind of conceptually what hospice looks like. In terms of a benefit, most hospice care is paid for by Medicare. It's covered by Medicare Part, e, Part A. Uh, Medicaid here in Kentucky also covers hospice services. Um, the VA covers hospice care. Most private insurances cover uh, hospice services. And, um, and in order to be eligible for hospice service, two physicians have to certify that a patient has a ter is terminally ill, which means that they have a diagnosis or prognosis that uh, life expectancy is six months or less if the illness runs its anticipated course. And basically Medicare says we'll pay for hospice care or we'll pay for interventions and therapies that are curative, but we won't pay for both. So any sort of medical intervention uh, related to that terminal diagnosis when an individual is under hospice care is, is palliative in nature. So the intent is to comfort rather than cure. Does that make sense? Everybody's okay? Okay. So, um, you know, as you might imagine, for individuals who have a serious illness or who are in the late stages of a serious illness, there are many potential sources of pain and discomfort. That can be physical pain, right? So pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, shortness of breath, anxiety, nausea, those type of physical symptoms that need um, attention. But there's also a real source of pain. It can be that psychosocial distress. If they've been alienated from a family member for 50 years and now they're finding out that Time really is of the essence, you know, can, can we fix that relationship? Um, severe spiritual distress for some patients may be the biggest source of uh, anxiety for a particular patient. We've had veteran patients, for instance, say, Who, who's going to forgive me for the things that I've done at war? You know, those are really difficult um, sources of uh, discomfort and stress. So many potential um, sources of pain and discomfort. There's also the whole issue about dignity and, and quality of life at end of life. So hospice care, what do we actually provide our patients uh, and families once they enroll in hospice care? Well, number one, probably what we're most well known for is an interdisciplinary team, and I'll talk about the team in more detail. We also provide all the medication, supplies, and medical equipment needed to treat the terminal diagnosis. So uh, medications to treat pain and other bothersome symptoms, medical equipment like hospital beds, oxygen, uh, wheelchairs, walkers, whatever that particular patient may need. Uh, all covered under the hospice Medicare benefit. So the interdisciplinary team, um, we have physicians who are experts in pain and symptom management. Uh, so much like if you go to your oncologist, your oncologist has expertise in, in uh, understanding cancer and treating cancer. A hospice and palliative care physician is board certified in pain and symptom management. Most, many of our patients have uh, a wide range of uh, conditions that adversely affect them, and it's those you need that specialized medical care, really, um, for, for many of our patients. Um, so a physician who has speci specialization in hospice and palliative medicine. We have hospice nurses who routinely visit patients either in their home or nursing home or uh, in our inpatient units. And they're really, they have advanced certification in hospice and palliative care. Also, what our nurses are really fantastic at, in addition to making sure that our patients are well cared for, is educating our patients and caregivers on what to expect with the diagnosis. We have found that you can, um, you can mitigate a lot of that fear and anxiety for both the patient and caregiver by telling them, you know, we kind of know how this particular disease is going to progress. Here's what to expect. Here's what we're going to do about it. Uh, and that's uh, of real comfort to the patient and to the, the family. Uh, so we have nurses that, again, have that advanced certification. Uh, social workers who provide all the psychosocial uh, care for our patients and our caregivers. 
Um, you know, I can't tell you, they, they really have, they're really dynamic individuals. And Hospice of the Bluegrass were fortunate, again, because of the support of our communities, to be able to, to hire almost exclusively masters prepared social workers. That's not something we would have to do in order to get reimbursed. It's something that we, you know, just our commitment to quality. And like I said, we're able to do because of our communities. And, um, you know, they're experts on knowing what other community resources the patient and family may get, um, may be able to access at a critical time. Uh, experts in having difficult conversations um, around goals of care. If there's uh, disagreement among family members about what we should do with mom, that sort of thing, uh, they're really good about facilitating those important conversations and um, just excellent resource for advocates for those patients and families. I talked about um, the, some of the spiritual distress that a particular patient may have at the end of life. We have hospice chaplains who all have a Master's of Divinity degree or an equivalent from another faith tradition. They've all gone through supplemental clinical pastoral uh, education programs. So they, uh, you know, these are not, these are highly trained um, individuals working with our patients and families. And, you know, for many people, you know, they have a good source of spiritual comfort and so they may or may not want support from our chaplain but our chaplains are out there asking our patients uh, you know what's given your life meaning sense of connectedness with the transcendent if they're co connected with a particular faith tradition it's the chaplain who may be able to facilitate and get that minister out there by the home um, and so you know the the chaplain's involvement is really much like all of hospice care is dictated by the needs of the patient and family uh, we have certified nursing assistants who can see patients up to five times a week, maybe even seven days a week, uh, and they provide a lot of the personal care for that uh, particular patient. Uh, you know, dignity is an issue at end of life. You know, as you start to lose the ability to take care of yourself um, and, and how comfortable you know, would you be with a spouse or a child assisting with uh, bathing, uh, going to the bathroom, those type of things. So it's our certified nursing assistants who assist with a lot of those activities of daily living, and they do so in a way that um, really ele respects the patient's dignity. Um, and, and so that's a very important member of the uh, interdisciplinary team. Uh, so that's sort of the team generally. A couple other members I want to talk about. Uh, after a patient dies, Hospice of the Bluegrass provides bereavement counseling for 13 months after a, after a patient dies. That can take the form of individual counseling sessions for any member of the family. So it could be the spouse, it could be children, um, wh whomever. Uh, so bereavement counseling individual. We also have group counseling sessions in, in our communities and that can be very general grief group or we can have specialized uh, grief courses where it may be a just for folks who've lost a spouse, for instance. And uh, these groups are all free um, and at no cost to our community. Again, something extra that we can do because of the support we get from our communities. Uh, we also do camps and then provide a lot of grief education both to our uh, uh, families and to the community at large. One of the unique things about hospice care Make sure I'm doing okay on time. I want to leave a few minutes for questions. One of the unique things about hospice care is, is it, it essentially started as a grassroots movement. It was community volunteers, volunteer nurses who were sitting uh, by the bedside of actively dying patients. And because it was so volunteer driven initially, volunteer participation and involvement is actually written right into the legislation, uh, the Medicare legislation. So hospices are required to have volunteers. And we are very fortunate that we have a very dynamic and robust group of volunteers in both um, Fayette and Jessamyn County uh, that provide a wide range of services for our patients and for our caregivers. And I, th I like to think of what they do as providing practical support. So they're there as a friendly neighbor checking up on the patient. They provide respite care where they'll go in and stay with the patient so that the caregiver can take a break from being by the bedside. Transportation. They also provide support to all the departments in our agency for folks who want to give back but may not want to work directly with patients. They uh, solicit for silent auction items for our events as they've done for the upcoming golf scramble. Um, you know, just real uh, advocates for hospice care. They're involved in all aspects of our organization. So I wanted to mention the volunteers as well. And uh, the last thing I want to say about the interdisciplinary team is when people think, when a patient dies, the caregiver receives a survey and it allows them to evaluate all aspects of hospice care. And we get to see those results. They're all anonymous, but when people thank us, they don't thank us for the hospital bed, they don't thank us for the medications, they thank us for the people. It's being present 
with that patient and with that family throughout the dying process. Um, and so it's the interdisciplinary team that has really created and reinforced hospice's reputation. Uh, I like to think they try to create a positive experience for that patient and make a positive memory for that family that they got through the death of their loved one. Um, you know, they're calm, they're compassionate, they're teachers, they try to restore to the extent that's possible control to the, to the family and to the patient. So a couple more comments, then I'll take questions. Uh, one, I just want to make you, you, you aware that um, there's a perception that hospice only takes care of patients that have a cancer diagnosis. And while that was true 30 years ago, that has changed uh, dramatically, um, such that now only about 40% of the patients we take care of have cancer. So we take care of any individual who has uh, a serious illness and, then they're, and they're in the last six months of life, which could be uh, dementia, heart disease, lung disease, any, any condition as long as the two physicians uh, say that they have approximately six months or less to live, as long as the condition um, continues to progress. Uh, in terms of, there's also can be a perception, you all not so much because you've had a community hospice here for uh, almost three decades, that hospice care is a place and you know most hospice care takes place in a patient's residence. So another thing I didn't mention, but if you ask people where they want to die, people do not want to spend their last few months going in and out of hospitals. They want to die at home uh, and that's where most hospice care takes place, home being their private residence or a uh, nursing facility long term care facility of, of some type. Um, only about a third die in hospitals. And then th the other thing, um, although hospice is a benefit for the last six months of life, in practice that it doesn't work out that way. Half of the patients that we take care of die within two weeks. Um, a, thir a third die within a week. So oftentimes what we hear from our patients um, initially and then our caregivers after the fact is I wish I had known about hospice services sooner. I didn't realize the scope of services and how much benefit you would be to that particular patient and family. So we're always out there trying to um, let people know about the value of hospice before um, too late. I mentioned already who pays for hospice care. Um, you know, I get paid by Hospice of the Bluegrass to come and say nice things about how wonderful our people are, and they are. You can trust me, we've got a really premier hospice organization. But if you look in the academic literature and the medical literature, there are really three dominant recurring themes. And that is, number one, uh, when hospice becomes involved, uh, hospice is able to provide better pain and symptom management, resulting in a higher quality of life for the uh, patient and uh, overall enhanced well-being for that caregiver. Uh, number two is that hospice care is underutilized, so uh, just as I mentioned, people receive services way too late, if at all. And then uh, hospice and palliative care tends to be a good use of the health care dollar, uh, meaning that if you were to compare a, a group of patients that does not take advantage of hospice services uh, and, and compare them with a group of patients who do receive hospice services, the hospice cohort is going to be a little less expensive because they're not going in and out of emergency departments and being admitted into to hospitals and that sort of thing. So. Um, just wanted to make that known. We already talked about the golf scramble. We have morning flights, afternoon flights. Um, I hope to see you out there. I'm a horrible, horrible golfer, but I'm going to, you know, for the good of the agency, go out there and play. Um, and then I always like to conclude with uh, hospice nurse wrote an article called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, and it was basically of all her experiences uh, th three or four decades as a hospice nurse, what, did, what kind of regrets were people expressing on their deathbed? And I'd just like to share that because hospice is really about living, and I think our patients and families teach our clinicians, uh, and our volunteers, and administrative staff on a daily basis, and th this, is, this is pretty good. Number one, uh, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. All you driven people in the room, as I can see. Number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. Uh, number five, I wish I'd let myself be happier. Um, we're very active on social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest. Hope you'll connect with us or consider connecting with us. Uh, before I open up for questions, I just want to say the first thing you can do to support Hospice of the Bluegrass is we have a big stack of bags and pens back there. Take a few on your way out so that we don't have to take them back. Okay, are there any questions I can answer? I left exactly five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the referral, the question is about referral sources. Uh, anybody can make a referral to hospice. Typically, it's a patient's physician or specialist. We get um, a lot of referrals from nursing homes or hospitals, but really anybody, if you've got questions, can call and make a referral, and a nurse will come out and assess the patient to see if that particular patient meets the eligibility criteria for hospice. Thank you. Good question. 
you want to come back, Rhonda? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Yes. Yeah, the question was about private insurance and does it cover hospice services? And the answer is probably. Most um, commercial insurance providers will cover hospice services. They may not reimburse us as highly as <laughs> Medicare or Medicaid, but uh, at Hospice of the Bluegrass, we uh, would take care of any eligible individual irrespective of their um, insurance coverage. Um, again, that's something we can do as a nonprofit. But yes, typically, almost all have a, a hospice benefit. Good question. Okay. My mama died recently, and the hospice mm. of the Bluegrass was there at Royal Manor Nursing Home with her for a little over three months, and they were absolutely amazing. Oh, well, thank you. And um, I appreciate more than you can imagine all of the time and energy they spent with my mother and how peaceful she was with all of the nurses and caregivers. It was a, it was a good thing for me to see yeah. as her caregiver, too. So I really have high regard for all that you all do and all that you look for. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. Thank you very much. Anything else I can answer? Three minutes? Two minutes? Doesn't have to be about hospice. We can talk about Yes, sir. If home or nursing home is not an option, mm -hmm. Well, uh, we do provide services in an inpatient setting, so uh, there are, you know, we, that's about a third of the hospice deaths are, are in the hospital. Um, I'm trying to think about the best way to answer your question. Um, did that answer your question? I'm trying to think how to, <laughs> how to sort that out a little bit better. So do you, Yeah, and I should just mention that we will take care of any patient, you know, wherever they are. We've taken care of homeless patients, patients at the Hope Center, um, really we'll go to wherever the patient is. But sometimes, and maybe this is a way to talk about your question, you know, people may want to die at home, but because of their um, disease progression, that's not possible. We, we can't get their pain under control, for instance. And we do have options to admit patients to hospitals and so that we can uh, monitor them a little bit more closely and make sure that their symptoms are adequately managed.